And if you got one already, take one another one and pass it on to somebody else. Make sense? Yes, yes sir. Ready. Are you sure? Yes, yes. sir. Brother Lee, ready. what are we saying? Ready, ready. Right, Kim Zong Queen, I'm gonna introduce you to the scientist, the man himself, the organizer and convener of all that we have witnessed this today, Kings and Queens. Yes, sir. I want to show him big love. Big up. Because he's doing serious work, filling certain gaps in our knowledge. Things that we don't necessarily always focus on. You yeah. understand? Yes, yes, sir. Show him some love, Kings and Queens. Clap your hand. Thank you for Thank you everyone, thank you, and welcome. I'm glad to see so many people here for such an important event, an event about knowledge yourself. Yes, greetings everyone, greetings, greetings. Greetings. Yes. Right, so, the security guards are on my case, they want us to be out by seven, so I can't really sky out with this, we got to get through and, you know, go into this science, yeah? yeah? So, before we start, let's just, you know, give you a little intro to what we're going to be talking about. <laughs> I have seen gods fly. I've seen men build weapons that I couldn't even imagine. Uh-huh. I've seen aliens drop from the sky. Yeah. But I have never seen anything like this. Which one of you Oh yeah. Now, this is arguably going to be the most interesting science plan ever been a part of. We are going to cover math, English, chemistry, biology, and physics in this one class. These are the things to look out for. If you want to be up to date with all of our things, all of our courses, all of our events, then please log on to the hiddensciencecademy.com and make sure you add your email to the mailing list, yeah? And then you'll be up to date with everything that we're going to be <coughs> delivering, yeah? Now I know there's some people that here that have done a hidden science either course or event. Make some noise if you've done a hidden science course. <laughs> yeah? Nice. Those are the members, those are the people who have actually done my courses, yeah? I know other people are like, what are you making up so much noise for? You know what I mean? Members be like, you got a lot of day. You got a lot of day. <laughs> so, what are you going to learn today? This is what I am going to be covering in the next hour. I am going to uncover the hidden purpose of the pyramids. Yes, let's get down to the truth as to why they were truly built. I am going to be talking about the similarities between London culture and ancient Egypt. In particular, I am going to link grime with Kemi. That's never been done before. Man. Trust me. I'm going to talk about the truth about melanin and electromagnetism. How does that relate to the pyramid? And lastly, by the end of my lecture, we should have answered the age-old question, what is true knowledge of self? Yeah? Now, as a question, let's just ask that now. What is true knowledge of self? Or let me ask it in a different way. Why is it important to have true knowledge of self? Why is it important to have knowledge of self? Anyone? We need to know who we are. Know who we are. To know where we're going. Achieve your purpose in life. Empowerment. Know where we're coming from. You know yourself, know what you believe you're not. Now your true purpose. Okay, quite a few there, but our last one was true purpose. Okay, 
Now, I'm going to go back to that later. But as we're going to be talking about London culture and Kemet, let's just give an overview of London culture. So, let's get into this. Can you help us, us Americans, understand the difference between a crime artist and just a rapper? What is the technical difference? Okay, so the technical difference is rhyme is a strong sound. The instrument which dictates it is made that is one number. It is taking the world by storm. Crime started in East London around 15 years ago and is now more popular than ever. Step up! London for quite some time has been figuring out how to break their scene. The biggest artist in hip hop is championing their sound. Will this continue? Will grind grow? Interesting question. Will grind grow? Before I go any further, wait, who claims this as their culture? Grime, anyone? No one? One person. One person claims grime. Two people. Okay. Interesting. All right. Now, as this presentation will focus heavily on the science of chemi, it makes sense to have a definition of science that is easy to understand. So here's my definition of science. Science is logic backed up by evidence. Logic is just common sense. And then you just back up your common sense with evidence. So for example, if you were to ask me what's two plus two, common sense will tell me Four, right. For it to be a scientific fact, I need evidence. So I'd go around and say, what did you get? Two plus two. You said four. What about you over there? What did you get? Two plus two. You got four as well. Now I've got logic backed up with evidence. That's science, yeah? Now once you realize that's all science is, all of a sudden, science becomes very, very simple. Which is interesting because a wise person once said, if you can't explain it simply, you don't understand it well enough. That was Albert Einstein, arguably one of the greatest scientists of all time. He said if you can't explain it simply, you don't understand it well enough. Now I'll take it one step further. I'd say you don't understand it well enough, or you do, but you just don't want me to understand it. So you explain it in a confusing way. Yeah? So it's one or the other. So, we're going to try and keep Kemet as simple as possible. Because there's a lot to learn. And for me, I find science quite simple. But a lot of people find science very confusing. And what I've found is science is nothing but observation. Science is nothing but observation of the universe. How does the universe work? And through my observations, I've found that anything that you're confused about, it will lead to conflict. That conflict can be internal and or external. So if you're confused about something, it could lead to mental conflict, physical, psychological. The conflict then leads to pain. And we, sometimes we think pain is just physical, but pain can be mental, emotional, psychological, spiritual, yeah? So anytime I'm explaining anything, I like to have total clarity on the situation because I have found through my research and through my observations that clarity leads to harmony and harmony leads to peace. Now, what did they call peace back in Kemet? Ma'at. So this is what we're trying to achieve here, ma'at. So we need to avoid confusion. But many people find science very confusing. I do talks in the schools, like with primary school teachers, I do childhood obesity training. And I always ask the children, what's your favorite subject? Hardly any of them say science. Now, why is that fascinating to me? Because again, science to me is just observation of the universe. Now, why should that fascinate them? Because they're part of the universe. Why should you like science? Because you're part of the universe. But for some reason, a lot of people find science very confusing. So we're gonna to try to have total clarity, which will lead to harmony, which will lead to peace. And someone once told me, and see if you agree with this statement, someone once told me, the easiest way to confuse someone is to make them think the opposite is true. Make them think up is down, left is right, and right is wrong. Once they have the opposite as their basis of truth, 
Everything else will only confuse them. So throughout the whole of this lecture, I'm going to try and keep things super simple. Because to me, science is nothing but two plus two. Or, as another wise man once said, <laughs> Boom! Two plus two is four, minus one, that's three, quick maths. Quick maths. That's all we're going to be dealing with today. That's all science is to me. Anyone that's been to a Hidden Science Academy event before knows it's just quick maths. We're just going to break down science, the science of the pyramids, the science of Kemet. Quick maths, yeah? All right. So I'm going to be talking about London culture and I'm going to be talking about Kemet. Now to keep things super simple, let's start with what it is. So what is Kemet? So let's start with what it is. What is Kemet? Well, just a simple Google search will tell you that Kem is a hieroglyph, yeah? The, eight, the Egyptian hieroglyph for black in the Garden of Sinus is numbered I6. Its phonetic value, how you pronounce it, is Kem. And in the dictionary of the Egyptian language, it lists no less than 24 different terms of Kem in the game black. So there's no confusion as to what Kem is. Kem means black. Everyone agrees with that. All the scientists agree Kem means black. So what is Kemet? All right, well, Ancient Egypt is commonly referred to as Kemet, believed to be a reference to the Black Nile Delta Earth. The determinative 049, which is this, is the glyph, that's Kemet, yeah, is used to designate the term for country inhabited cultivated land. So country or land, yeah? Therefore, if Kem means black and the T represents land, then what's Kemet? Black land. Black land or land of the blacks, yeah? No confusion, very simple, all right? In the ninth, in 198 BC, Rosetta Stone uses the black hieroglyph three times to make the name of Egypt, which is Kemet. Mm -hmm. So there's no confusion. Egypt used to be called Kemet. Kemet means land of the blacks. All right, so where is Kemet? Now, here's a, a, a old map of Africa, classical African indigenous civilization before Asiatic or European invasion. So who can spot where Kemet is? Right at the top. All right, so location-wise, let me write this down. I've got to write down things so I don't forget. Let's say where the location is. So here's Kemet, K-M-T. What's the location? North, south, east, west? North, east, okay. So north, and I'm gonna put stroke east, that's where this great civilization is. However, there's a big civilization here called what? Kush. Kush. Now, what's that about? Now, a lot of people understand that even though Kemet was great, we're going to salute Kemet. What do we need to do? We need to salute Kush as well because they got a lot of influence from south of the Nile. Yeah? So, even though we give a lot of credit to the northeast, we've got to give credit to the south as well. Yeah? yeah? All right. So that's where Kemet is. Now, let's just take in some of the Kemet culture. Just take a look at that. Look at the detail. Look at the intricacy. Like they say, the writing is on the wall. Look at that. That is just so amazing just to view, just to look at. Yeah? I mean, who built this stuff? Who built this stuff? Was this you lot? Is this your culture? Yes. Yes, <laughs> says the young king. Look at this. They built it out of the rocks. Yeah? So who claims this culture? Show of hands. As theirs. So, okay. So the majority of people in here claim Kemet as their culture. In other words, those are your ancestors. This is my people who built this stuff. Yeah? Look at that. Absolutely amazing. Yeah? And even when people who are not from the culture find these things, they want to try and break it down, you know, destroy it. Mm -hmm. Or break it down and hide it somewhere. Mm. Look at this. This guy's like, how did you get that in there? <laughs> yeah? And he's like, he's like, no, I've got a plan. We can make some money from this. What we do, yeah, we just charge people to come in here and look at it. Mm. And he's like, that will never work. And he's like, yeah? Mm. <laughs> look at that. Yeah? Because the culture is powerful. powerful. Very powerful culture. So I'm going to write here, powerful. Culture. So again, the majority of us claim this culture as theirs, yeah? Okay, uh, what's this? Can someone tell me what that says? 
cartouche. Cartouche, but you don't know, you don't know what it says. So the majority of us in here claim this as our culture, but we can't read it. We don't understand it. All right. Now it's no accident that such a high state of culture existed in Africa, and you and I know nothing about it. That was the great Malcolm X. Yeah. And there was a, a French guy by the name of Count Constantine. Yeah. He said, just think that this race of black men, today our slave and the object of our scorn, is the very race to which we owe our arts, sciences, and even the use of speech. He said that in 1787 after seeing the Sphinx in Egypt. Yeah. Now I haven't even shown you what I'm going to be talking about today, which is the pyramids, the great pyramids. Hold on a second. That's not Kemet. What's that? This is Sudan, Kush, yeah, where there's much more, hundreds more pyramids in Kush than there is in Kemet, yeah? But today we're talking about Kemet, so we're going to be talking about the Great Pyramids and the science behind them. So if we were to look inside the pyramids, here's what we'd find, yeah? You've got the King's Chamber right in the middle, yeah? I'm not going to go through all of it, but you've got the King's Chamber right in the middle. Connected to it, you've got the Grand Gallery and then the Queen's Chamber here. And then look at this. It leads on to this subterranean chamber, which is underneath. All right? Just keep that in mind as we go along. Now, why, would it, why were the pyramids built? Well, according to mainstream media, they found that out this year. If you've been um, making sure that you're keeping attention to your culture, you would have seen mainstream media run with this. Secrets from the Great Pyramid of Giza continue to unfold as scientists discover we can focus electromagnetic energy through its hidden chambers. RT's Trinity Chavez explains. Built by the ancient Egyptians more than 4,500 years ago, the ancient Pyramid of Giza is the oldest of the seven wonders of the ancient world. But scientists are becoming more and more astonished as they make new discoveries about this mysterious landmark. Archaeologists in Egypt have stumbled upon a new discovery. They found that its shape focuses electromagnetic energy, such as radio waves, through its hidden chambers and under its base. Its ability to concentrate electric and magnetic energy was discovered by an international team of researchers led by scientists from ITMO University in the Russia city of St. Petersburg. According to a study published in the Journal of Applied Physics, the team created a model of the pyramid to measure its electromagnetic response. The model was used to see how wave energy is scattered or absorbed by the pyramid, and the group tested the interactions with the wave of the resonant length. Researchers say that if the pyramid's ability to concentrate energy can be recreated on a nanoscale size, the same science could be used to create more efficient sensors and solar cells. Interesting. So, once this came out, the whole of the mainstream media ran with it. Did you see these stories? So, look at this, Sunday Express, they ran with it. The Great Pyramid of Giza can focus electromagnetic energy in shock discovery, yeah? This story came out Tuesday, July 31st, 2018, yeah? Who else? The Independent, they ran with the story as well. What day? Same day, yeah? Then you've got Sky News, they were a little bit late, one day late, Wednesday, August the 1st, same thing, mysterious structure was built thousands of years ago and experts are only just learning about its hidden powers. Who else? The Daily Mail online. Wait, hold on a second, look at this. 30th of July 2018, so they were the first. Mail online, scientists discover Great Pyramid of Giza can focus electromagnetic energy through its hidden chambers. Even the sun. Even the sun ran with the story, yeah? That's when you know, listen, they're up to something. If the sun is running with the story, yeah? So I'm thinking, right, is the sun gonna give credit to, you know, our ancestors about the, the, the pyramids? So they say, electric discovery, scientists make incredible discovery about the ancient Egyptian Great Pyramid of Giza, which, folk, which could focus energy through its chambers, yeah? It says, scientists have found that the Great Pyramid of Giza is capable of creating pockets of higher energy in its inner chambers and its base. When you go on to read the article though, they do, they do what I call a backhanded compliment. So they give the ancient Egyptians a backhanded compliment, yeah? Listen to this. They say here, but the scientists believe the unusual discovery about the electromagnetic energy in the pyramid 
are just a coincidence. <laughs> Listen to this. They believe it is highly <coughs> unlikely ancient Egyptians knew anything about the science behind it and would not have built it in this way deliberately. Oh, Wait a minute, hold on a second. Wait, hold on. Hold on a second. Wait a minute. So I'm going to build something, yeah? Something that you can't build. Five, six, seven, eight thousand years later, you're going to find out something about something that I built. Turn around to me and say, I bet you knew, I bet you didn't know that you could do this. That's like me building this phone, you not knowing how to build it and saying, you know this phone can make calls. You know, make calls. <laughs> you didn't know that, did you? Yeah? Who else? Science alerts. Even mm -hmm. you, all the online science websites, they ran with the story as well. But check what they said as well. Similar thing. So, theoretical research by an international team of physicists oh. has discovered that the Great Pyramid of Giza can concentrate electromagnetic magnetic energy. They go on to say, and although the ancient Egyptians probably weren't aware of this weird design work, the study could be important for nanoparticle research in the future. What? Even the Metro. Metro ran with the story, yeah? Let's see what they say. They say, now a team of researchers have found that its shape focuses electromagnetic energy, such as radio waves within its internal chambers as well as its face. Yeah? The effect is so pronounced that the team now wants to build tiny uh, nanomolecules. They go on to say, although you could make many assumptions about how the ancient Egyptians were organizing their pyramids to create the best AM radio setup for the dead, it's highly unlikely that the ancient Egyptians knew about these properties. And it's just an interesting coincidence of how the pyramid stands. Coincidence, yeah? They think that we built this amazing thing that they can't build, yeah? And we built it, you know, to point at the stars, point at, aligned with everything, and it's a coincidence. Check this out. Coincidence. John Charles Webb Jr. has made a profound discovery about the location of the Great Pyramid that is unfortunately widely ignored because of its utter implausibility. Using Google Earth, we can measure the exact latitude of the center of the Grand Gallery inside the pyramid. It is 29.979-2458 degrees north. The speed of light in the vacuum is 299,792,458 meters per second. Incredibly, these are the same numbers. How can this be? This correlation is either pure coincidence or evidence of something very profound. The meter as unit of length and the practice of dividing time into seconds would have to be coordinated for the location of the Great Pyramid to encode the speed of light. Nothing may sound more improbable, That's but this is exactly the sort of numbers game that I think the ancients played. That's a coincidence. Really. Now, what does one of the very few black scientists have to say about that? Now, I know he's been caught up in the Me Too movement, poor thing. I say it wrong. Yeah? They caught him as well. But what does he have to say about, you know, the pyramids? Because they, for, for whatever reason, they don't want to give the ancient Egyptians any credit to what they built. So instead of saying that the ancient Egyptians built the pyramids, what would they say? Alien. One of my favorite channels is uh, National Geographic Channel. Mm -hmm. I like watching uh, shows about ancient aliens and, 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 and that sort of thing. You're an alien guy. You well, know what happens is people don't believe that ancient humans had any intellect at all. And they say, oh, they couldn't have built this. It must have been by aliens. But give, give, the, give our freaking species some credit for figuring stuff out. Okay, well, that's what I want to ask you because the other day I was watching this thing about pyramids and people truly believe that the technology to build pyramids wasn't of this earth because at the time the pyramids were being made. So it was Europeans coming to Africa seeing an amazing civilization that they could not imagine an African build and they must then invoke some other cause that enabled them to build it. Excuse me, uh, you know, <laughs> clever people come in all colors, yep. all right? Okay. So just because you can't figure out how somebody built the pyramid doesn't mean the people who built the pyramid got help from aliens. That's all I'm saying. Yeah? Oh, whatever. Yeah, man, give it up for that. Real talk. This is 
why we need to understand our culture. If this is our culture, we need to understand it. And to understand culture, you need to understand language. So throughout today, I'm going to be breaking down the etymology of words. What does etymology mean? The study of the origin of words and the way in which their meanings have changed throughout history. Etymology, yeah? So let's start with the word pyramid. What does the word pyramid mean? Yeah? We're going to get into English now. <coughs> well, what if we start with pyro? Who knows what pyro means? Fire. It's to do with py pyrotechnics. You're a pyromaniac, you like to set things on fire. Yeah? <laughs> so pyro is to do with fire. And mid, well that just means middle. So what does pyramid mean then? Fire in the middle? Fire in the middle. That's interesting because there's actually a book called Fire in the Middle by James Ernest Brown. And in this book, which he calls The Mystery of the Great Pyramid, he suggests that in the middle, they create um, infrared energy. So electromagnet electromagnetic energy they absorb and then create infrared energy which they can then radiate outwards. Yeah? Infrared. This was backed up by Christopher Dunn's book called The Giza Power Plant. So everyone talking about this electromagnetic energy, but in particular, the middle creating infrared energy. Do you know what infrared is? Heat. That's what infrared is, heat. Yeah? And he goes on to discuss it in this history clip. Engineer Chris Dunn believes the answer can be found by further examination of the shafts in what some call the Queen's Chamber, where traces of zinc and hydrochloric acid have been discovered. I believe a chemical coming in through the northern shaft was hydrated zinc, and the other chemical coming through the southern shaft and into the chamber was dilute hydrochloric acid. These are actually seen on the chamber walls. Dunn suggests that the two chemicals were poured down through the shafts and then mixed together inside the Queen's Chamber, triggering combustion. Well, this vessel represents the Queen's Chamber. Into the tubes, we're going to pour hydrated zinc and then hydrochloric acid. When you bring these two liquids together, a chemical reaction occurs, and a product of that chemical reaction is hydrogen. And you can see the vapor, the hydrogen, escaping through the chimney, and there you have the reaction. Dunn speculates that the hydrogen gas traveled from the Queen's Chamber into the King's Chamber. Then, the vibrations from the subterranean pool energized the hydrogen atoms into a microwave energy beam. The evidence that indicates the use of hydrogen can be found in the King's Chamber. Absolutely amazing. So, the pyramids can focus electromagnetic energy right in the middle and then radiate energy out, yeah? And if we all live off of energy, can you imagine these pyramids in... So they're using hydrogen, so that's the fire in the middle, because if you look at the sun, the sun is a hot sphere of hydrogen, yeah? You guys can check this on your phone. The most abundant element in the universe is hydrogen. The sun is like 70% hydrogen. So when they're talking about fire in the middle, you can generate that infrared heat in the middle, yeah? So is that what it's all about? Generating that infrared heat and then it radiates out, outwards and radiates down underneath. So that's to do with electromagnetic energy. Now, in order for us to understand this, we need to understand what electromagnetic energy is. Now, anytime I'm talking about science, I like to go to like simple science uh, websites geared towards children. Because I believe if the science website is geared towards children, then they should be able to explain it in a simplified way. So this is BBC Bite Size. So we're going to break down electromagnetism. So electromagnetism is electricity 
and magnetism. So let's break down electricity. What is electricity? It says here, electricity is the presence or flow of charged particles. An electric current is the flow of electrons around a circuit. So very simply, electricity is the flow of electrons. Now to understand that, we need to go into atoms. Atoms is like the smallest particle of matter that can exist. So here's an example of an atom. You probably maybe remember this at school if you wasn't you know, sleeping in the science class. But here's an atom. So the atom has protons and neutrons that make up the nucleus in the middle. And whizzing around the atom, you have what? The electrons, yeah? So what they're saying with regards to electricity is electricity is the flow of these guys, the flow of electrons. So if that electron moves from this atom to another atom, this atom to another atom, that's the flow of electrons. The blue ones, neutrons, and then around them you've got the electrons. That's what an atom is. And it's these flow, the flow of the electrons, these moving, whizzing from atom to atom, that is what electricity is. Now, this is the electromagnetic spectrum from low frequencies to high frequencies. Now, a lot of people find this confusing, but it's very simple. How many people have a phone? Yeah? So if you have a phone, you understand about electromagnetism. Electricity is what runs your phone. Magnetism is what stores all the information on your phone. That's all you need to know about electricity and magnetism. Electricity runs things. It's running the lights in this room. It's running this laptop. It's running the phone. And magnetism stores things. There's a magnet in your laptop. There's a magnet in this phone. If you have a credit card and you turn it round, that black strip mm. is the magnet that stores all the information on the card. Mm. That's what electromagnetism is. Electricity runs things, magnetism stores things. But now, just from having this, you'll understand that with electricity comes other things. So, with electricity, there's a flow of electrons. But what else comes with electricity? What just happened to my phone? Light. So therefore, you can't have electricity without light. What else can my phone do? Heat. It will heat up. So you can't have electricity without light or heat. If someone rings me, what will my phone do? Vibrate. So you can't have electricity without heat, light, and vibrations, which is sound. Yeah. So what you're looking at is heat, light, vibrations, and sound. Yeah. These are low frequencies, these are high frequencies. Let's stick with light. Light low frequencies are radio waves and infrared. This small section they call the visible spectrum is the only light your naked eye can see. They call it Roy G. Biv. Red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet, yeah? Ultraviolet, your, the eye can't see that, but it's still light. X-rays and gamma rays, yeah? So these are high frequencies, these are low frequencies. Remember what they said the pyramids do? The pyramids can emit infrared light, infrared heat, yeah? So this is all you need to know when it comes to electromagnetism. Now, why is this important? Well, because there's been evidence to suggest that there was light inside of the pyramids. Light inside of the pyramids. Really? Because if there was light inside of the pyramids and light bulbs and lamps, then who's this guy? <laughs> the this is who they teach us invented the light bulb, right? Or who's Benjamin Franklin? They told us he invented or discovered electricity. But like it says there, electricity is a form of energy and it occurs in nature. So it was not invented. As to who discovered it, many misconceptions abound. Some give credit to Benjamin Franklin for discovering electricity, but if the ancient Egyptians were dealing with electromagnetism five, six, seven thousand years ago, how did you discover it? Yeah? So is this the truth then? The pyramids can focus electromagnetic energy. We need to understand what the pyramids are all about. And to understand that, we need to go back to the hieroglyphs or the menu nature. Yeah? So, the glyph for pyramid, phonetically, how you pronounce it was mer or more. So this is the glyph for pyramid. There were no vowels used during, you know, ancient languages. It was all consonants, so it was pronounced, or it was spelled M-R, mer, or more. 
Mur, Mur, however you want to pronounce it, is M-R. So the original word for pyramid is Mur. Yeah? So what does M-R mean? What does Mur mean? Well, because there was no vowels back then, what happens if we were to, you know, put vowels in between the M and the R? What sort of word would we come up with? Let's start with M-A-R. Well, if we put an S at the end of it, we get Mars. What's Mars? Planet. It's, they tell us it's the fourth planet from the sun, yeah? Mars is also the Roman god of war. Okay, so that's a bit negative, Mars, all right. What about if we put a H at the end of it? Marsh. That's to do with Marsh. Martian man. So we're talking about outer space again, yeah? Or Marsh, that's to do with like swamps and that sort of stuff. Okay, a bit negative. What about marine? What does that mean? Submarine. So we're talking about something to do with water and the sea, yeah? Marine. Anytime you put the I after M-A-R, you're going to find that it's to do with water. Look, maritime. It's to do with the sea, yeah? Alright, so does pyramids... Is pyramids connected to the sea? Interesting. Alright, what about M-E-R? What sort of words? Well, mermaid. So we're going back to the sea. Okay, so are the pyramids connected to the sea? Are the pyramids... What has the sea got to do with the pyramids? Alright, what about M-I-R? What sort of words do we get? Well, miracle. Miracle. What's a miracle? Something extraordinary. Something, you know, out of the ordinary. Something extravagant. Like, what about mirage? What's a mirage? When you're seeing things, like an illusion. Yeah? So, some could argue, when you put an I in between M-R, it starts to become associated with even mirrors. Mirrors are quite mystical. We talk about black mirrors. It's to do with magic. Okay, so is the pyramids to do with magic? Well, some would say they're magical. Yeah. What about an O? Let's put an O in between M and R. What sort of words do we get? Mourn. What does mourn mean? When you're sad. Someone just died. Yeah? Big up the young king, by the way. Mourn. What other words do we get? More. What's that about? Death. And mortal. Death. So anytime you put an O in between M and R, it's associated with death. Are, is the, are the pyramids associated with death? Mm. Well, they believe that there were dead people that were buried in the pyramids. So maybe, okay. What about M U R then? Well, even M-O-R and definitely M-O-R-T, those are the most common root words for death. And there's loads of examples, mortal, mortuary, even morbid, more and mort, they're all to do with death for some reason, yeah? And then mur, well, murder, that's death as well. So, let's get this straight. Are the pyramids to do with the sea? Are they magical or are they to do with death? Yeah. They're to do with death, okay? Knew it. Yeah, maybe. Let's find out. So let's put another O in between the R. Does more mean death? Or does it mean black? Who were the Moors? They were black people. From Mali. Okay. And they ruled. They went into Spain and Europe. Yeah. But why is more, why is the word more associated with death? Hmm, why is more associated with death? And most people associate more with black. Interesting. This is a clip from the Royal Shakespeare Company. They're doing Othello. Othello was a more. Okay, listen to this. Yeah, um, Bob, can we have some light, please? Um, we left Adam on his own to research this play. Uh, apparently he looked up more in the dictionary and thought it was a place where you tie up boats. Which would it totally Which obviously, in this context, is obviously totally ridiculous yeah. because in the 16th century, the word more referred to a black person. <laughs> I feel like such a dork. <laughs> yeah, well, go with the feeling. Look, yeah. um, 
in even performing Othello, because, as you know, the part is written for a black actor. And yeah, and I guess you might say that we're uh, racially challenged. Exactly, yes. Yeah. So, <laughs> the bottom line is we're not going to be able to perform Othello for you tonight. I'm right. really sorry yeah, about that. Awesome, awesome. Right now, we can do it, we can do it. We can do it. I got an idea that's totally bootless. Yeah. If we just get like a, um, if we just get like a rhythm going, you know, we, cool. just, we just like, like a, like, um, like, here's a story of a brother by the name of Othello. He liked white women and he liked green jello. <laughs> Iago, who made himself a menace because he didn't like Othello, the more of Venice, and Othello got married to Desdemona. He took her for the wars and left her alone. It wasn't Mona. A grown up. He, he left, left her alone. He didn't write a letter and he didn't tell a phone. Ah, so <laughs> so she was chastity tight. She was the daughter of a dude. She was totally white. And Iago loved Desi like his honest love Venus. And Desi loved Othello. Because he had a big sword. Yes, he did. <laughs> Whoa. Now. All right, so interesting. Now, so there was no confusion there. More meant a black person. But for whatever reason, more means dead. Like today, more means dead. So that's the reason why black gets associated with death. That's the reason why we wear black to funerals and that sort of stuff. But you see what they did at the end there? They started to imitate the more. Yeah? And. Just through doing my own observation, I find that a lot of people do that with our culture. They like to imitate our culture. So what, what movie is this? One of those Hollywood, Egyptian movies. It doesn't really matter which one it is. It's all imitations. It's Europeans playing Africans. Europeans playing Africans. Imitation. So when it comes to this powerful culture from the Northeast, a very powerful culture, it's constantly imitated constantly imitated look at this this is a list of actors hollywood actors that have played ancient egyptians notice anything wow ancient egyptians yeah africans so i found by doing my research that they love to imitate Powerful cultures. They're not going to imitate cultures that are weak. Why would you? They imitate powerful cultures. Here's how you know your culture is powerful. When it's constantly imitated. When it's constantly deciphered and decoded. That's when you know you have a powerful culture. Yeah? That's when you know you have a powerful culture. When people are imitating it and trying to decode it. Case in point. Hello, my name is Jade, yeah, and today I'm going to tell you about the real London accent, yeah, because that's where I'm from. <laughs> and like, we don't talk like how you're learning in your textbooks, you know what I'm saying? Oh, beware. This can get quite cringy. No one's going to find out about it, innit? You flopped, you know that, innit? Innit, innit, innit. In it. My name's Anne Booth, and I'm going to chat to you about like all the slang we use in London, innit? Like, fuck what, mumsy? Oh my days! Because I got that at the end of the day, yeah? Like, when when you come to London, you're not going to be able to, um, to understand people. But I'm going to be soft, though. 100% waste, man, you are. Oh, that's how much trouble I'm in blood. Just clutch TJ, man. Don't Go on, family, lad! So, I'm going to give you the lowdown, like, all the lingo in it. So, let's get started. Man, anything came, man. Shut your mouth, man. Fam. Get me a ball for Lisa, who's got more links, fam? I'm over late, bro. Alien, bro. Blood. Are you stupid, bro? <laughs> you can use these interchangeably, and it's a way to address someone, usually your friend. You're right, blood. <laughs> beef. I like this one. Beef. Is it beef, bro? Beef, beef. To have a fight. You don't get beef in it, then, no? You want beef. Meaning, you want to fight. You've got some beef going on there. It's like some kind of like dis disagreement between you two or something. I'm not going to have any beef between you lot. Babe, don't be so fake, man. I warned you not to be so fake, man, but you never listen. Being blatantly obvious about something. You're too f***ing babe, 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 babe. You can use it for another context, which is like if you um, get caught or found out about something, so you can say something like, don't bait me out, meaning don't grasp on me or don't uh, <laughs> tell on me kind of thing. Does that make sense? Now I'm going to introduce you to some of the like words that we use when we're speaking English, yeah? 
so that you know what we're saying when you come when you come to London, when you come to my end, you can say the right thing. Yeah? Right, so, um, um, in your textbook, you're told to ask for something. In this accent, you ask. You ask for something. Ask them blood. That means ask for something. <laughs> Yeah, I kind of use this one, but like, I don't use this one seriously, I just kind of like take the piss out of it. I'm like, oh yeah, I'm from the ends, isn't it? Because crazy ends, isn't it? <laughs> and it's just like area or neighborhood, and it kind of have like the connotations of like a bad neighborhood. Are oh, you from the ends? No, it doesn't. <laughs> bus, to bus something, means to wear something. So you're busting sick crepes, you know what I'm saying? Trainers or shoes or sneakers. You're wearing very nice trainers. You've got some sick crepes. Get me. means to relax somewhere. Yeah. Can we go cot? <laughs> Let's go relax somewhere. Merc. Oh yeah, Merc. <laughs> this one's quite funny. So Merc, so like, oh. So initially it meant like to kill someone, and then it kind of like meant to insult someone. So, oh, that guy got Merc, you know. What if you're just going about your business and you see someone looking at you. They shouldn't be looking at you, right? You can say, don't watch me. Don't watch me. Turn your head. Don't watch me. <laughs> okay, this one. This one is nervous or scared. And what about this one? Wagwan. Wagwan. Okay. <laughs> Um, a little bit related to don't, wa uh, don't watch me. Move from me. Move from me. That's it for this video, guys. Uh, maybe when you come to London next, you could be using these words as a piece of I just wanted to say, though, that these phrases, I don't know if they originated from London, but a lot of people do use them in London. And when I've used these words, my London friends understand what I'm saying, but then people from across the world don't, they're like, what are you saying? Just speak English, please. <laughs> oh, and one more thing. Um, subscribe to my channel, yeah? Before I mark you. <laughs> you got tricked, didn't you? <laughs> okay. So, like I said, this is how you know you have a powerful culture. Because the culture is constantly being imitated and decoded. If you didn't have a powerful culture, why would they want to decode your culture? Right? And it's not just, you know, the average person that wants to decode your culture. Even the police want to. Why would the police want to decode London culture? Look at this. Police hope this embarrassing slang dictionary will help them engage with young people. This was like two months ago, yeah? Do you know a roadman from a painting? They wrote this on their board. Look what they wrote. Let's write, let's read through it. Beef ting fat, starting an argument. Pain means good, attractive. Bro, brother, associate. Blood, in brackets, satin. Yeah? Satin. Satin, that's what they wrote. Yeah? Number five, wag one. Wag one one. He's greeting. Hello, hello. Yeah? Check this one out. Roadman. Check. What's a roadman? Listen to this. Teenager who involves themselves in smoking weed, no education, puffer jacket, man bag, and act hard on a bike. Alright, what's a teen? Teen means sexual relations. They teen. Yeah? Feds, popo, that means police, they should have put us. That's me, yeah. Yeah. yeah? Gold means greatest of all time, FMO. Fear of missing out. My favourite, yeah, Stormzy. Not, not the weather. The rapper of the <laughs> And then the last one is swear down, which means tell the truth. Wow. That's how you know you have a powerful culture when they're trying to decode it and decipher it. Speaking of Stormzy, by a show of hands, anyone break Stormzy? I love Stormzy. Anyone break Stormzy? Yeah? 
Stormzy, he launched the Cambridge Scholarship for Black Students. Yeah. So, hands. Who rates Stormzy? Okay, the majority of people rate Stormzy. But when I asked you, do you rate London culture? In other words, grand culture. One, two people put up their hands. That's interesting. So you rate the person who's from the culture, but you don't rate the culture. That's interesting. That's like rating the fruit, but hating the tree. Do you get that? And look what he's wearing, by the way. His, this is his um, label, hashtag murky. Murky, M-E-R. Where have we heard that before? Murky, yeah? He's launched his own Adidas line. What else has he done? He launched his own publishing imprint called Hashtag Murky Books. Now, going back to Ambu, what did he say Mark means? He said it used to mean dead, but now it means you insult someone or something like that. So Hashtag Murky, what does Murky mean? Yeah, so this is why it's important for you to understand your culture, because you misinterpret that and you might think that means death. Murky, death, yeah? Because that's what it used to mean, murk, to murk someone. Again, when you put the M-R and you put something in the middle of it, for whatever reason, it's associated with badness, it's associated with death. Murky, though, just means killing it. So he's going to kill it when he launches these books. Do you get that? Yeah? And he's announced uh, the first headliner of Glastonbury 2019. So he's going on with big things, but he's from this culture. Yeah, he's from Grime. Now, I'm not saying that you should like Grime, but I find it interesting that you don't rate this guy, but you don't rate the culture that he was birthed. Now, he's got the hashtag murky hat on there. Yeah, and again, murk does not mean dead. Now that's important because if you're from the culture, you don't even need that to be said to you. You understand it, yeah? If you're not from the culture, you could potentially make a mistake trying to decode the culture. True or false? True. All right, I'm going to show you a clip from one of my favorite grandma artists, his name's Chip. And in this clip, very, very short clip, he might say the word dead. He might. See if you notice if he says the word dead. But what I want you to think is, when he says the word dead, does he really mean dead? Right. Yeah? So again, from the culture. If you're from the culture, you get it. So he, he might say the, the word dead once or twice, see if you can catch it. But does, when he says the word dead, does he mean dead? All right, listen carefully. Gas off nonsense, but I could over evil. Still out here on evil. Don't say what you heard and don't say you said it. Come on now, stick to your G code. But let me try to edit to your room is dead. I don't owe nobody nothing, dead. Never pay Chris Brown nothing, dead. Swear my granddad's great, he's dead. Man, they can't test me on the mic, so they wanna try to switch the vibe instead. I said I am the grime scene savior. Real talk, man, I'm on a back from the dead. But woman, I want some dead, some dead. I only ask when you are dead. Pepper rhythm, three minutes, five, man. If you can't do the math, dead. This ain't between no ends, dead. It's just me and my pen, dead. I got shit to do, choose a drop, chest the car, hashtag. I'm still alive, not dead. Hating, wish I was dead. Sorry, I can't run out of bars. Did he say the word dead? Yes. <laughs> did you notice that he said the word dead? Now, how many times did he say the word dead? Twelve. Twelve. He said the word dead twelve times. Now, out of those twelve times, when he said the word dead, how many times did he mean the word dead? Dead. Maybe two, one or two. Right. That's when you know you're from the culture. You understand the culture. I'll give you a quick, very quick story. I was on the bus, yeah? And I go upstairs on the bus. I saw people, young people from the culture sitting at the back of the bus. I sat at the front of the bus. I've got my headphones in. I'm listening to my music. Now, the, the, the boys at the back of the bus, they were making up noise. Now, because I rate the culture, when the culture talks, I listen. So I took out my headphones and started to listen to their conversation. This is how their conversation went. Hey, you know I got expelled from school today, you know? And they're like, what? Why did you get expelled from school? I right, with Miss McCarthy, man. She was on some foolishness. What happened? Yeah, so we was in class, yeah? And she's chatting pure foolishness, yeah? And my phone's going off, you know, man's got snaps and Insta and all them thing there. I'm not even looking at it. And she's on some, Jamal, get off your phone. I'm like, Miss, I'm not even on my phone. Jamal, don't use your phone. I'm like, cool. I move my phone over to the side. She keeps on talking. Then all of a sudden, my phone goes off. Hear her. Jamal, if you don't get off your phone, I'm going to confiscate it and you're not going to get it back until the end of the day. 
I was like, that's dead. Mm -hmm. You know, she went to the headmaster and said that I threatened to kill her. Oh. <laughs> and I got expelled. Yeah? That's what happens when you don't understand the culture. You're not from the culture. That's what happens to our kids. Yeah? So he said, that's dead. But well, what did he really mean? Well, if you, this is how you know you've got a powerful culture because if you was to go online, there's a lot of sites that are decoding this culture. One of them is called UrbanDictionary.com. You heard of that? Yeah. What do they say dead means? Okay, so here's one example. When you're past the point of something being hilariously funny, when you've laughed as hard as you possibly can, often expressed online by putting an asterisk in front of and behind the word, as in dead. So that doesn't mean dead, that means you're having, you're laughing, right? All right, here's another one. Dead ting. A girl or boy, <laughs> listen, I don't know who write this stuff. <laughs> a girl or boy who does not look very good, or in other words, clap. <laughs> E.G. John, listen to this, listen to this. They girl was trying to link me yesterday. Jake, guy, she's a proper, Dead thing. Don't shift her, yeah? Alright, calm. This is how you know that the people that write this stuff are not from the culture. Yeah? This is how you know that the people that write this stuff who are trying to decode the culture are not from the culture. Because no one from the culture talks like this. Yeah? But you get people who are not from the culture who are trying to decode the culture and then are going to explain what the culture is to you, yeah? These people are like... Rude Boy MC at that. Yeah, exactly. Rude Boy MC. Rude Boy MC who probably lives in Scotland. Yeah? Trying to decode the culture. These people who write this stuff, who are not from the culture, they're like... They're like Egyptologists. That's exactly yeah. 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 boring or uninteresting. You feeling this party fam? No blood, it's a dead thing. Okay, all right. What about, that's dead, that's the one that Jamal used. No, not true, that's not true. So maybe Miss McCarthy should have went on Urban Dictionary, yeah? I heard you again. Wow, that's dead. Yeah? <laughs> <laughs> now, when it comes to London culture, especially grime, where do they say grime originated from? East London. East They say grime originated in East because of this guy, yeah? Wiley. Wiley. Alright. Well, let's hear what Wiley has to say with regards to the origins of grime. Grime was birthed from garage. <coughs> Heartless crew were the only ones and so solid. And a couple others in garage who spat bars over it, similar to us like yeah. they was more like garage MCs but with bars mm -hmm. so if we did not listen to Heartless and Soul Solid would we have gone and done what we've done mm -hmm. maybe not mm -hmm. it's, I, I just realized this I spat bars I was a jungle MC I wasn't a garage MC so when I heard Heartless I would have loved it but I wasn't that so they were the first person I heard spitting on garage tempo and beats that were, you know, Fonty used to mix things with Raga, they used to spit on it. Yeah. So, them elements were early grime elements, really. Not, they didn't make no beat. I made Eskimo, yeah, yeah. which is a grime song, but they spat over instrumentals that wasn't always garage. Yeah, yeah. You see what I'm saying? So, I, I just remember that. And Soul Solid, whoever made the, uh, oh no, that's the word. Oh no, whoever made that? Oh, they, they could say, yeah, I'll sorry, bro. Because I made the first beat that wasn't garage, but was... It's just... Alright, so... Does anyone know where uh, he's been said about Heartless and Soul Solid? Where are Heartless from? North. North? Okay. North. Heartless grew up from North. But he said at the end, whoever made... Oh no, that's the word. He said they could say that they started grime because that was the first 
Braintree, mm -hmm. the first. Mm -hmm. Where's so Solid from? South. 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 Oh, and <laughs> this culture is always being misinterpreted. True or false? Misinterpreted. Because in this culture, the word dead does not mean death. Yeah? Okay, now why is this important to know? Well, this guy is called Professor Booker T. Coleman. Yeah? He's one of the best professors when it comes to comedic science. Yeah? Hear what he has to say with regards to how the comedic people, the Africans, viewed death. And upon trend, and see, this is why we as an African people don't have a fear of death, because death don't exist. Death is only a doorway to the next get down. <laughs> death is only a doorway to the next get down. Yeah? So even back then, they didn't believe in death. So Kemet is a culture. They thought the pyramids were to do with, you know, a burial tomb. They didn't know it was to do with electromagnetism. So their culture is always misinterpreted. Okay. And they believe that more means death because they associate the pyramids with funeral, with death. But that's a misinterpretation because they don't believe in death. So let's just recap. There's this powerful culture called KMT. <laughs> which originated in the Northeast but was heavily influenced from the South. Very powerful culture which is So, yes, go on. Yeah, was that before? Oh no, that's the word. Yeah, yeah. So, you're right, you're right. We've got to give credit to the Heartless Crew then, yeah? When it comes to the origin of grime. So, where are Heartless Crew from? Tottenham, not London. Not London, not. <laughs> Tala, Tala. Also London. Not London, so we have to give credit to North. And Rex 32, also London. Not London, so we have to give credit to North London. But, but, uh, real talk, but going by the godfather of Grime himself, when he talks about the origin of Grime, he says the person who made, oh no, that's the word, they could say they started Grime because that was the first Grime tune. On wax, the first. Who made that tune? So solid. Where are they from? South. Okay. They're from South. Yeah. So Wiley said he was highly influenced from the South, from So Solid crew. Now, why is this important? Well, like we say, in this culture, the word dead does not mean death. Now, this is very interesting because if you were listening carefully to what Brother Robin, Robin Walker was talking about when he went through this, the ancient Egyptian book of the dead, what do the ancient Egyptians believe when it comes to death? Well, they believed that Osiris would, you know, bring them back to life. They didn't believe in death. That's what this book was all about. What happens after that point? They called it the afterlife or the underworld and all that sort of stuff. So the ancient Egyptians didn't believe in death. So they talk about the moors, the pyramids, to do with, you know, burial tombs and that sort of stuff, but they didn't believe in death. So why would the moors or the pyramids be associated with death? 
So this culture doesn't believe that dead equals death. So let's just recap. There's this powerful culture called KMT. Which originated in the Northeast. But was heavily influenced by the South. A very powerful culture which is constantly being imitated and misinterpreted. Because in that culture, the word dead does not mean death. Hmm. Now, now, what I found, what I found from doing my own research is that some person once said to me, the easiest way to confuse someone is to make them think the opposite is true. Yeah? yeah. So, they tell us that more means dead. Yeah? And because more is associated with black, black gets associated with death. Hence the reason why we wear black to funerals. Yeah? Because it's associated with more, and more means dead. But that's from people who are not from the culture. Yeah? Now, a wise person once said to me, the easiest way to confuse someone is to make them think the opposite is true. Make them think up is down. Left is right, right is wrong, yeah? And you'll have a confused person for the rest of their life. And if they're confused, that means you can control them, yeah? So, when I started to do my research, they're telling me more means death, yeah, so the pyramids are associated with death, more means death. When I did my research, based off of that, that the opposite is true, what do you think I found out? What does more really mean? All right, this is the Phoenician alphabet. Now, why is this important? Well, Phoenician, let's think about the word Phoenician, phonetics. That's where we get the pronunciation of words, yeah? Now, the Phoenician alphabet, they read from right to left. Roman alphabet is from left to right. So what have they done? They just flipped it. They've just done this to it. Let's just flip it. Let's turn it around. Flip it. Yeah? Alright. So, again, there were no vowels in ancient languages, so we're dealing with consonants. Yeah? So you've got X there, and you've got these things here. Alright? Now, what does mer mean in the Phoenician alphabet? So we have to go to the Phoenician alphabet. Now, in Andrew Broder's book, he breaks it down very simply by showing you the evolution of alphabet starting from Kemet all the way down to all the way up to Rome yeah so this is what we're dealing with right now but this is how it started Kemet and it was glyphs these glyphs meant something every glyph meant something but look what they did people who are not from the culture look what they did so we're starting with A yeah which was the ox head that was the glyph in Kemet the Semitic people they changed it a little bit but you can see where it originated you can see that yeah, yeah. Then the Phoenicians, they changed it a little bit, made it look like a letter. That's the Phoenician alphabet, yeah? Can you see that looks like an A on its side? Yeah? What did the Greeks do? Borrow this for a second. The Greeks did this. Yes? So the truth is this, and the Greeks said, is anyone looking? <laughs> no, I found it like that, I found it like that, yeah? So now we've got, what? Now we've got this, and then by the time we get to Rome, we get an A like that, yeah? What about B? Started with this, and then by the time we get to Phoenician, it's Beth. Beth means house, you know, Beth, Lehem, Ham, yeah? But look at the B, it's facing that way. What did the Greeks do? Turn it round. What's the easiest way to confuse someone is to make them think the opposite is true. They just turn it around and then we're left with a B here. Look at C. It was facing that way. Phoenicians had it as a hook. What did the Greeks do? Just flip it. Just turn it around. Yeah? And then D flipped around. Alright, so you can see they're just literally flipping the script. Okay? So let's get to Mer. What does Mer mean? Let's go to the M. Well, M is representing in Kemet as water. You see how simple this stuff is? 
If I was to ask any child in there, draw water, what would they do? Yeah, wait, no. Waves, yeah? So that was the glyph for water, yeah? By the time we get to the Phoenician language, it looks like a W. So what did the Greeks do? Flip it. So now we've got an M, and that's how we get the M. So M, M, R, let's go to the R. The R started with a head. That's what it was in Kemet, yeah? Resh equals head. By the time we get to the Phoenicians, it looks like this, facing that way. What did they do? They just turned it around, and now we've got the R. So, M, M, R, is water head. Wait a minute. The Phoenicians read from right to left. So, let's start here. Head of the waters. Head of the waters. That's what mer or more really means. It doesn't mean death. It means you're the head of... If you're the head of something, what does that mean? If you're the head of state. You're the king. You're the ruler. So the head of waters means you're the ruler of the waters. That's what the Moors done. They traveled the world and they were the head of the waters. That's the reason why if you looked up the word more in the dictionary, there's always nautical terms. What does nautical mean? To do with the sea. So more to secure a ship boat with cables or ropes to be secured in this way. Even this one, look at this one. A less common word for anchor. More means anchor? Anchor. An anchor. Where have I heard that? Anchor. Oh. Um. What does unk mean? Life. life. So does more mean life? No. More means water. And water means life. In other words, where there's water, there's life. According to who? Leon Marshall? No. According to NASA. When NASA are going around trying to find out if there's life on other planets, what do they look for? Water. water. Look at this. Why do we care about water on Mars? The first spacecraft from Earth to visit Mars was Marina. There's the Mer again, or Mar, yeah? In 1965. Since then, several robotic spacecrafts have flown by, orbited, or landed on Mars and sent back lots of information about this world so different from our own. So they found signs of water on Mars. They go on to say, all these signs of water are very exciting. Why? Because on Earth, almost everywhere there is water, there is, there is life. So what does more really mean? Head of the waters, yeah? That's why women, you are the head of the waters. You have waters coming out. Everywhere. Be <laughs> <laughs> very careful about nobody. Cut! 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 Don't make me get excited. The man love water. You get me. Water. Yeah, what? Isn't it when your water breaks that you know that life is about to come? Yes. So being the head of waters means you are the master of life. Life. Do you get that? So we've got people who are not from our culture telling us more means dead, mm. more means black, mm. and black means dead, mm. yeah? When really it means life, life, water, yeah? Find out if life ever existed on Mars. NASA scientists will look for water and places where living things might use heat energy, infrared, from underground. Now check this out. They will also look for signs of carbon. carbon. Hold on a second, wait a minute. Signs of carbon? What did Dr. Sebi say? about melanin. Dr. Sebi said there's no such thing as melanin, it's carbon, yeah? And I get why he says that, because melanin is more carbon than it is anything else. Melanin is made of carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, and oxygen, but it's more carbon than anything else. So they're trying to find life on other planets and they look for water and carbon. If there is life on other planets, what sort of people are they going to find? Great <laughs> soldier! Now listen, Great. if you were to look at the molecular structure of Come carbon, on, black man. you know, electrons, protons and neutrons, you'll find that the molecular structure of carbon is made up of six electrons, six protons and six neutrons. Six Six. Six. Where have I heard that before? Yes. This is why you need to understand your culture. Because if you don't understand your culture, people will make you think you're the devil. This is the reason why we need to know our culture. 
and we need to understand melanin. Because if we don't understand it, people can make you think you're the devil. So let's quickly go over melanin. Now I'm going to show you two scientists that break down melanin. The first scientist is this guy. His name is Dr. Carl Marit. You can search him on YouTube. He's got, a book, he's got a video on YouTube where he talks about melanin for over 15 minutes. Very powerful. So his name is Dr. Carl Marit. Look him up. What does he say about melanin? He says that it's the chemical key to life. He says that melanin has a broad absorption spectrum. It absorbs thousands of times more electromagnetic radiation than chlorophyll, which is interesting because were you taught chlorophyll in school? Chlorophyll is the green pigment that can absorb sunlight and that's involved in photosynthesis. Yeah, so they teach you about chlorophyll, but according to this scientist, melanin can absorb thousands of times more electromagnetic energy than chlorophyll, but they don't teach us about melanin. He says it exists in many tissues besides the skin. Did we know this? Melanin is not just your skin, it's inside of your organs as well. He says it can absorb radiation and emit radiation. It can absorb radiation and emit radiation. When they say radiation, that means light. So it can absorb light and emit light. He said that heat turns melanin into an electrical conductor. What did the moors do? What happens in the middle of the moors? Heat, fire, heat energy, it infrared energy. So that means if the ancient Egyptians went into that moor, it would charge them up, electrically charge them up. What did Dr. Sebi say? The body is electric. And then he says it can emit radiation in the form of infrared. I was like, what are you, are you, te wait, this is what moors do. This is what the MERS do. Moors can absorb electromagnetic radiation and emit le electromagnetic radiation. So what is he saying? That what the Moors can do, you do. Hmm. Now, why is this important? Well, the sun emits electromagnetic radiation in the form of visible light, UVA, UVB, and infrared. Now, look how powerful infrared is. Infrared light is the one that um, penetrates your skin the most. Infrared light does what they call structure water. In other words, it electrifies water. It charges water up. Yeah? So if you've got protons, neutrons, and electrons in the water, what it does is separates the protons from the electrons, creating like a liquid, liquid battery. If you looked at a battery, you'd have a plus end and a minus end. That's the protons and the electrons. According to the science, infrared light does that to water. It charges water up. It electrifies water. Yeah? And the guy behind most of this science, science, his name is Dr. Gerald Pollock. He's done most of the... Um, research when it comes to structured water, which is electrified water. Anyone that's talking about structured water, they always reference this guy. Now, I found a podcast of this guy, yeah? Now, this is how he, look, this is how he shows it when you look at um, one of his slides on YouTube. It separates the electrons from the protons, creating like a liquid battery that you can use for electricity. I found a podcast online where he's talking. This young guy, is interviewing Gerald Pollock. Now, Gerald Pollock is the godfather of structured water. Any water science, everyone talks to this guy. Now, this young guy has just watched the movie Black Panther, and he's wondering if there's anything in the universe that can do what vibranium did. You know, something real, yeah? And he went to some health convention, and they gave him this black top, which uh, supposedly can absorb electromagnetic radiation and then emit it or keep it in. You know, like what vibranium did, yeah? So he's explaining to Gerald Pollock what this top does, yeah? Now, Gerald Pollock, I want you to notice two things in this short video. Gerald Pollock's listening to him, and then he drops a bomb. He drops the truth, yeah? What I want you to notice is, what does he do just before he drops the truth? And I want you to notice his reaction when he hears the truth. Listen to this. Oh, absorb it from your body. From your body, yeah, and it, and it keeps it in. in, in like, it, it absorbs it and then it, it gives it back. So you haven't gained anything, or you're just the, presenting the In some the way, law. you could say maybe, like, you're kind of also blocking the infrared from the environment. I guess that's, you know, you can look at it in, in two different ways, but I think it absorbs it, and... Um, it, well, another, another possibility is that, you know, sometimes materials absorb visible light and then re-radiate in the infrared region. And I wouldn't be surprised if that's what, what, this, stuff, uh, what this stuff does. But um, 
you know, melanin is, is something that my do. Melanin is black and it absorbs all wavelengths, all visible wavelengths, but it, it generates uh, in the infrared. So, so it could be that that's the mechanism that, that you wear the clothing and absorb light from outside and it re radiates in the infrared wavelength region and then your body gets that infrared which it needs to build easy water. I, I'm not sure, but that's one idea. Did you see that? Did you see that? <laughs> now, what did the, what did Dr. Gerald Pollock do just before he talked the truth? Oh man, oh, I'm about to tell the truth about melanin oh, online as well. This is bad because every scientist knows there's a melanin code of silence. You don't talk about melanin in the public. You do not talk about melanin or moors or infrared because if you start talking about it, people might start putting you know two and two together and start understanding this stuff. So he knew he was just about to break code. Oh, this is going to hurt. I'm going to have to tell this young guy the truth. Uh, melanin can absorb radiation and emit infrared. When the young guy heard that, what was his reaction? He couldn't believe it. This is what the truth does to us. This is how powerful the truth is about melanin. Now, if melanin can emit infrared light and infrared light structures water, well, we need to remind ourselves that the human body is over... 70% water. So look at this, your kidneys are over 80%, your blood over 90, muscles over 70, lungs over 80, and brain over 80%. So if our melanin can structure our internal waters, think about how electrified we could be. Yeah, if our melanin's functioning in its optimal. So like it says there, water is for more than just quenching your thirst, no typo, yeah? So water, the universal solvent, water, more. Remember the M is associated with water. All right, other scientists. This guy's name is Dr. Richard King. You can search him online. He's done loads of books with regards to melanin. What, is, what does he say about melanin? He says in his book, A Key to Freedom, he says that there are four major broad subsections of the melanin life ocean. One, cosmic melanin. In other words, that stuff that we see at night. Dark matter. They call it dark matter. What is it really? Two, planetary melanin, three, plant kingdom melanin, which is chlorophyll, and then four, animal kingdom melanin. He said it's found throughout the entire body of all humans in their skin, eyes, endocrine glands, blood, heart, muscles, lungs, gastrointestinal tract, kidney, sexual organs, and the brain. Did we know this? He says that melanin in the brain is called neuromelanin. And within the human brainstem, there are 12 centers of black melanin, including the locus coeruleus, and the substantia nigra. Do they teach us this in school? Do they teach us this in college? Do they even teach us this in university? No, where are you gonna hear about this stuff? 12 centers of black melanin, which all together are called neuromelanin. So I was fascinated when I found out this stuff. What? Neuromelanin, and everyone has it by the way. Everyone has neuromelanin in their brain. So I wanted to go online and see if I could find like a simple definition of what neuromelanin was. Started to do my research, so. I went onto certain sites. This site is called sciencedirect.com. And again, in science, this is the way they confuse you. They confuse you through the language. So, done a bit of research. This is sciencedirect.com. What do they say neuromelanin is? They say neuromelanin is a catecholamine-based polymer pigment which is con concentrated in the neurons of the human SN pars compactor. A lot of scientific jargon trying to confuse us. So I went on to Google to see if I could find an easier definition, a simple definition. On Google it says neuromelanin is a dark, dark pigment found in the brain which is structurally related to melanin. It is a polymer of 5,6-dehydroxy... <laughs> Hold on a second, wait, oh, wait. It's a what? It's a poly... Myrrh. Someone help me out. What does poly mean? Many. Many. And myrrh? Yeah. Poly means many. And myrrh means. Where have I heard that before? Myrrh. Yeah. More. M myrrh. Are you trying to tell me that I've got many pyramids in my brain? Would you believe me if I said to you, there's such a thing as pyramidal cells, and we all have them, wow. and they're shaped just like tiny. 
tiny, tiny pyramids. And they control your electric circuit. Remember, Dr. Sebi said the body is electric. We've got pyramids in our brain. This is why we need to know ourselves. We need to understand this. So what are we really talking about when we're talking about the pyramids, the Mers, the Moors, whatever vowel you want to put in between the M and the R? Well, they can absorb and harness electromagnetic radiation. But when we talk about radiation, again, even the word radiation is kind of jargon. We're talking about light. And if we look inside of the pyramid, like we did earlier, you see you've got the king's chamber and then the queen's chamber. That generates electromagnetic energy in the form of infrared. But then, it can use that infrared light and channel it down to the subterranean chamber. What does infrared light do to water? Charges it up, electrifies it. And if it's charging up from here and then it's going down to the subterranean chamber, where do you think that chamber was connected to? The Nile, the river Nile. So think about, it. we had these moors in this great culture called Kemet that was charging up not just the air but charging up the water underneath and the water led to the river now. So you've got the river now that's electrically charged. So guess what? Your plants, your fruits, your vegetables. Remember anywhere there's water there's life. So if we're charging up the river now that is the greatest life on earth. The, you drink that water, you're charged up, you eat the plants from that water, the herbs. This is what more really means. More is to do with water and water is to do with life. And speaking of water, if we were to look at the molecular structure of water, what's water made up of? Yeah, so it's H2O. In other words, two hydrogens and one oxygen. So if you were to look at it visually, the shape of a water molecule might look like a pyramid. Huh. Oxygen, two hydrogens, this is the shape of a water molecule. I'm sure that's just a coincidence. It's just a coincidence, you know. So what are we dealing with? Light. And then when we think about light, what's light synonymous with? Light is synonymous with knowledge. So if you can absorb all light, you can absorb all knowledge. In most religions, what else is light synonymous with? Light is synonymous with divinity. And in most religions, light is synonymous with God or Ra. So if, if the Moors can radiate infrared light, the, raw, the Moors can um, harness electromagnetic energy, and your melanin can do the same, then who are you really? Hmm. Who are you? At the beginning, I said, you know, studying the universe should fascinate you because, you know, you're part of the universe. You're not just part of the universe. You are the universe. Look at this. More. So, when it comes to more, you now know that more doesn't mean dead. That's a... Uh, misinterpretation more means life because it's associated with water this is how we radiate this is how we absorb energy from the sun direct from the cosmos through breathing through food even grounding yeah grounding we get electromagnetic energy from the earth when's the last time you did grounding put your feet on the ground on the earth not on pavement, not on a carpet. <laughs> When's the last time you got grounded on earth, getting some electrons from the earth? This is what your black body does, it radiates. Well, what is light synonymous with? Well, some people will say light is synonymous with knowledge. So if you can absorb all light, that means you're capable of absorbing all knowledge. What else is light synonymous with? Power. Power. Light is synonymous with power. So if you can absorb all light, you can absorb all power. Some people, especially every religion, relates light to divinity. And to God or Ra. So if you're someone who can radiate, absorb all light frequencies and radiate, what are they actually saying about the black body? All right.
All right, they're kicking us out now. So we've got to finish on this. But we need to know what true knowledge of self is. So going back to the start where he said, your body. So you need to understand your body when it comes to science as well. Because just like a vehicle, if you have a vehicle but you don't have no knowledge of vehicle, when that vehicle starts to break down, even if it's a Ferrari, you're going to have to take that vehicle to where? Mechanic, engineer or whatever. And they now have control of your vehicle because you have no knowledge of vehicle. They can tell you, ah, oh, the ECU needs changing. Or it's the engine when it's the fuel tank. They can tell you anything because you're confused about your, view, your vehicle. Well, it's the same with you. If you don't know how your body works, when you go to the doctors, they literally have control over you. They can tell you anything. And I like this analogy of a vehicle because this represents knowledge yourself. Because like you guys said earlier, knowledge yourself is very important to your purpose. Knowledge yourself is about self-love, self-esteem, how optimal you can function, which is based on your humours. And look at this one, knowing where you're coming from. To know where you're coming from, what would you need in your vehicle? Mirrors, to look behind you, yeah? So this is my analogy of black history. You need mirrors so you can understand where you're going. Because let's say the vehicle, if you didn't have mirrors, how safe of a driver would you be if you didn't have mirrors? You wouldn't be safe. Would you be a dangerous driver? To who? To everyone and yourself. If you was driving on the road without mirrors, you'd be a danger to everyone on road, including yourself, yeah? That's how important mirrors are. Well, this is my analogy for black history. If you don't know your history, you become a danger to everyone, including yourself. Yeah? That's why mirrors are important. Mirrors. Mirrors? Drop the vowels. Mer. <laughs> mer. This is why this stuff fascinates me, because it's the mers that allow you to know where you're coming from and know where you're going. And you know what's fascinating to me as well? Did you know that the Mers, the Moors, were originally white and smooth and covered in white limestone? Because limestone is electrically conductive. So they were originally covered in limestone and very reflective. In other words, the Moors used to look like mirrors. The Moors used to look like mirrors. But now, you know, when people understand this culture, what do they do? Destroy it. Take off all the limestone, take off the gold cap, and we're left with this. These moors don't, you know, structure water. These moors don't harness electromagnetic energy. That's all been destroyed. These moors are not moors anymore. Pun intended. This is the reason why we need to understand science. You need to look at your body like a vehicle. Because once you understand science, you'll know where you're going. You know where you're coming from and you'll understand your true purpose once you understand how you work. True knowledge of self is science itself. That's the reason why I've created that course, The Hidden Science of Black Holistic Health. Because if you don't understand how you work, when you start to break down, you're going to take you to someone who you believe does know. It's just like having knowledge of car. If you don't have knowledge of your car, when your car starts to break down, who are you going to take your car to? AA, the mechanic or engineer, and they now have control of your car. They can tell you anything. Yeah, the exhaust, the exhaust system is gone. I've got, I have to change the exhaust system. Yeah, your engine. I need to change your engine or your air filters. Meanwhile, you don't know what they're saying, and all your, all your car needed was water. But because you have no knowledge of car, people can manipulate you. It's the same with your body. If you have no knowledge yourself, people can manipulate you. Yeah? Now on that note, I'd like to thank everyone for coming. Beautiful out. black man.